Uh, good morning, and I uh, hope everybody had a, um, or was able to enjoy however they wanted to, Canada Day, and whether it was fireworks or just going to bed early, whatever you choose. I mean, my kids were waking up with a lot of mosquito bites this morning and scratching away at them, so they always ask, How, when do they go away? And I was like, you've got to stop itching them, and they will go away, but it's just getting them raw, band-aids, all those fun things. Uh, this morning, if you want to f- pull up the sermon PowerPoint, uh, this morning, so, uh, you know, we've been going back to the basics in a number of things over the last few weeks. Libby was going back to the basics of um, our church name in the last few weeks, if you've been around. She was looking at the word evangelical and the word missionary as part of the evangelical missionary church that we are part of, uh, as well as, um, you know, today we're going to hymns and just going back to like the basic traditional songs that we're doing. And so uh, I thought I would... uh, Preach on just the basics, the gospel. And uh, all of you here, I mean, you know, I, you're here on Canada Day weekend, so I know you're very faithful and you're here because you know the gospel, right? And so I just wanted to dig in a little deeper. And what, what implications does it have for our life? We're going to be looking at uh, Galatians chapter 1. But first I wanted to uh, look at uh, just a number of slides, things that some advertisers have shown us over the years. Now, so a lot of these things happened before I was even born, some of these ads. But I was flipping through a National Geographic uh, magazine. This was a number of years ago. And I remember stumbling upon this, this advertisement. Um, if you can pull up the next, next slide, please. This advertisement on sugar. Apparently, you know, back in, I don't know, the 50s or 60s, sugar was a diet dodge. Apparently back then, this is the way sugar worked, is you could eat sugar and expect to lose weight. It's changed now, obviously, today. I don't know why. What I mean, makes sugar differently, I'm not sure. But uh, apparently it was all the willpower you needed you found in sugar, and you would lose weight. This next one is even, is even better that comes up, and it's the vitamin donut. I'm just like, Tim Hortons, what happened? Like, come on. I would love to go to Tim Hortons, get my coffee, and get everything I need in a donut. Why not? Um, next one here. This one I've never heard of. And maybe if anybody's seen this before or even tried it, 7-Up and Milk. Who would love some carbonated milk? <laughs> like, I don't know if anybody did this, but 7-Up was trying to push this on there on young families. A little, a little trick that makes a treat. So the next one, here's, now we get a little heavier. Here's a cigarette um, company trying to advertise. And I look at this and I'm just like, they must have already known that cigarettes were bad for you at this point in time. Because they're spending this entire like two-page ad trying to be like, hey, look it, scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. And you can't read the fine details, but I was reading them and it said like, after two months, people felt great smoking still. Two months. That's it. See, they're good for you. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. (laughs) Different times. This one, the next one is the Dutch boys' lead party. Who wouldn't want to buy a paint kit for their kids that was filled with lead? (laughs) I just, I saw this one and I was just like, oh, that's very cringeworthy. And then the final one here is uh, this very happy farm Farm wife singing, DDT is good for me. I don't know, if that, one, that one just is cringeworthy. I mean, they sprayed it on vegetables. It seemed like a miracle pesticide at the time. And then they realized it was staying on the food. It was getting into the environment. Birds were almost wiped out. I mean, it's only now, you know, I remember 20 years ago or 15 years ago going out west and seeing the first time ever I saw a a wild bald eagle, and I was just like, that's amazing. I wish they were here in Ontario. And today, you know, because DDT is now predominantly out of the environment, although if you still read, they still find traces of it. But there's eagles back in Ontario. There's a nest just outside of Plattsville, and it's really cool, I, you know, that kind of recovery. But again, this was a company selling part of the truth, but not the whole truth. 
And so today we're going to go into Galatians chapter 1, uh, 1 verses 12. But uh, like I always, I always like to, before we dive into a passage, just give you a little snapshot of the context. Um, what is Galatia? What is it? It was a Roman province uh, when at the time of the New Testament. Uh, if you want to skip to the next slide, which has a map for us. It is smack dab in the middle of what is modern-day Turkey. So this was a region for hundreds of years was under a, uh, a Greek rule. Uh, they had, you know, Alexander the Great conquered large parts of the, the Mediterranean area. And he established um, a Greek culture and people embraced it. So the language in this area was Greek. And then the Romans rolled through and conquered it. But the Romans kept the Greek language because... That is what the people spoke, and they already had a vibrant economy. And so they started to, it just became a Greco-Roman culture. They worshipped Roman gods. They had a very vital economy. And uh, amidst this group was many Jews lived in this area. So Jewish people, um, as you know, they had a kingdom around 700 BC. Between 7 and 600 BC, it fell. And at that point, Jews scattered across the Mediterranean. And part of the area where they scattered was in Galatia. It wasn't Galatia at the time. I don't know what country it was at the time. But they lived there. Many of them had families there going back centuries at this point. So as Paul um, did his first missionary journey, he was going to these cities. He was going around preaching in the synagogues first to the Jews. And then the Jews were... Uh, not all of them, but some of them were believing in the gospel and they were sharing it with, the, with their neighbors, their friends, etc. But where we find this letter to the Galatians, so Paul's already been there. He already knows some of the people that he's writing to. This letter here that Paul's writing, it's targeting a group, they, they call it the Judaizers. They were some Jews and we'll find this story, part of this story connecting in Acts 15, where Jews had went back to the apostles and said, this gospel isn't complete, basically. They said, we need more. These non-Gentiles, they need to be circumcised. They need to be following the law. And so, you know, without diving into Acts 15, essentially the apostles said, no, that's not what it is. It is for the Gentiles. They don't need to become Jews to be followers of Jesus. And so Paul is addressing this congregation. So let's um, go to the next slide. We'll start reading, reading our passage together. So verse 1, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me. Um, like any letter uh, back then, and even a letter today, you introduce who you are, especially if you're writing to numerous people or numerous churches. So Paul, he is writing, declaring himself. He's, he's establishing his authority right in verse 1 and verse 2. And it's not just his authority. It is the brothers and sisters with him. It's not just Paul being rogue. He is writing with the collective authority of the disciples or the apostles and bringing this letter. They're in agreement with him. And so he says, to the churches in Galatia. So this is to a region of churches. This isn't one letter to one church. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present age, evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so Paul is writing this type of blessing, this type of, this is who we worship together. This is God. And then he gets right to business. Verses 6 and 7. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evident, evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul has these nice greetings with this group of people. And then he gets right to business that you have perverted the gospel. And we know this from other scholars. This is the hard part about any preaching, is that I'm only preaching on 12 verses, but there's a whole context here. There's a whole history here that we need to understand a bit to understand what Paul is talking about. 
And they're perverting the gospel of Christ by adding in these extra requirements for you to be saved by Jesus. Then he goes on in verse 8 and 9, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Paul knows his audience. He is speaking to a lot of people who are Jews, who know the Old Testament. Their scripture is the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, it speaks of God's blessings and curses. So when there is a message that is false, Paul is saying, you are bringing God's curse upon you. You are bringing his judgment upon you because you are not preaching the truth. Now, there's a whole another topic to dive in here, but that is like a sermon series in itself of like, do blessings and curses apply in the New Testament? And we're not going to go there today. I, I don't think they do in the same way they do in the Old Testament because Jesus came, he brings a new covenant and bed he mates with mankind. But that's just my opinion, and we could dive into that, probably a lengthy conversation at another time. Verse 10, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So Paul, the apostles, they're all Jews. They're standing firm in what they have said the gospel is. The gospel does not require people to become Jews. That is not how you get into the community and the kingdom. It says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Do you ever, do you ever look at these things? So, if we were to keep on reading, Paul goes into his testimony, his story again. He reiterates it to these churches of where he came from, how he came to know Jesus, who he was. He was, he was an authoritative Jew. He knew the law. He practiced it. He tried to squash the church out initially. So, you ever wonder when he says, I have this authority, it's not from me, it's, it's from Christ. Uh, sometimes we have to just step back and say, you know, the reason we believe in the Bible is when it comes down to it, it comes to faith. But we also have to look at how do we, how do we get, how, do, how did Paul's letter get into our hands at the end of the day? Paul writes this letter. He may have wrote several copies or had some people with him, his brothers and sisters that were with him, copy a few copies to send to multiple churches at the same time. Perhaps he only wrote one and he sent it to one church and they copied it and sent it along. But here's, here's the thing. So this is, this is the very start of a letter. You think you're doing a great job following Jesus. You're one of these churches in Galatia. You get this letter. Says, oh yeah, from Paul. We know him. We remember him. He was great. You know, verses, verses 6 right away. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. He says, you're doing it wrong. That's the... Verse 5, verse 6, they wouldn't have had verses. They, you know, they're two paragraphs into the letter, and they're just like, wait, Paul's insulting us here. We've been doing this wrong. So they had a choice. They could have said, well, I don't care, Paul. See you later. But they copied it. They took Paul's words and said, we're wrong. Maybe some of them didn't, but enough of them did. Enough of them saw the truth in what Paul was writing. And they kept copying it. They kept sharing it. Until eventually it became part of our New Testament. Because the words in it they believed were inspired, as I believe today they are. So Paul, let's summarize. In this short verses, Paul gives us two pointers of essentially what our gospel breaks down into. The gospel... As he says it in verse 1, Jesus has been raised from the dead. That's a key part of our gospel. The other key part is Jesus died for our sins to save us. At its basic form, that is our gospel. It, nothing else really matters except that Jesus died for our sins and Jesus has been raised from the dead. 
I guess you have to understand that Jesus is God. It doesn't say that. And Paul did say that in the verses too. Those two things are the essential core points to our gospel. Without those, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you know, he couldn't have died for our sins effectively. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he wasn't God. Those two things are essential. So why did the Galatians change it? Why did the Galatians change the gospel? Why did they add to it? Well, I think it's pretty simple how they got to where they got to. So like we know, the Galatians uh, that were changing this, that were changing the gospel, perverting it, to use Paul's language, they were Jews. So they were Jews, they lived in this Greco-Roman culture, but they, for centuries, had maintained their way of life, their faith. Secondly, and this is something I always forget and need to remind myself of as I read the Old Testament, or as I read the New Testament, is that the Jews had the scriptures, the same scriptures that the disciples had, and the disciples referred to as they were teaching. The Old Testament. And so, the disciples weren't getting rid of the Old Testament. They were still using it as teaching points. And they were Jews, and they still had the Old Testament. It's the same God. And so, they kept it. You know, probably rather logically. Well, well, Paul didn't teach us about we didn't need to circumcise the non-Gentiles. But clearly, we, they, we do. That's what we've done for centuries. If anybody wants to join our community, that's what the males had to do. Of course, they need to follow the laws. They need to follow our, um, our food laws, our dietary laws. You can't just throw it all out. Those things are important. And so you can understand how they quickly got to that place. People smarter than I um, have understood this about our own culture, about the gospel that we share, that we have. And so, we actually, I'm going to go even deeper this morning uh, into, you know, some theology from a, from a theologian. He was a missionary and scholar, a, guy, a man by the name of Leslie Newbegin. And um, he was brilliant, and I remember being thrown multiple books from him that I had to read in, in university and even in seminary. And I was... I was too young and not smart enough to fully understand the words that he was saying. Like, it was all just new concepts to me. And so I kind of got it, but I didn't fully get it. But as I've gotten older, as I've gotten wiser, um, I've begun to understand his writings a bit more. And, uh, you know, I want to look at one passage he wrote um, from a book that he wrote called Fool Foolishness to the Greeks. And... Um, yeah, thank you, pulling that up. So he begins, The idea that one can or could at any time separate by some process of distillation a pure gospel unadulterated by any cultural accretions is an illusion. So he, also why I didn't understand him half the time is he writes very long sentences with very big words. But what's he saying is that, you know, Paul has broken down the gospel very simply for the Galatians. And I've heard, you know, I've, I've, I was a pastor for a time, and I've, you know, known a lot of different Christians, and I've heard people, sometimes they have talk about a new church they're part of, a new church that's starting up, or a church that's, uh, it's very successful, it's growing and stuff, and they will, they will use this term of like, you know, we, we preach the gospel pure, you know, we just, we just stick to the basic, just the gospel, as if, as if that's all they're doing. And so, Leslie Newbegin, this was back in the 80s, he pointed out that to think that you can separate the gospel from culture is an illusion. You can't do it. And here's why. And he says, it's an abandonment of the gospel. For the gospel is about the word made flesh. Now, he is, uh, he's calling us back to a term that we find in John 1. So, word made flesh, logos, the word made flesh. So, John chapter 1, in the beginning, if you could flip to the next slide, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. 
He was with God in the beginning. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's in verse 14. Why was this significant when Paul wrote it? Or not Paul, John wrote this. So Greek philosophers, they believed that the logos, which is literally means word, they, they had it being a force which structured the universe. It was, a, it was reason. Now, the Greeks had their gods. They had you know, a pantheon of gods. But the Logos, the Greek thinkers that had a lot of influence, they had this, this force that they saw that acted behind everything. And as we know, the Greeks heavily influenced uh, the Mediterranean world. The, the language that they spoke was Greek. So Old Testament Jews, uh, you know, from the time the Greeks conquered them, were hearing this philosophy, were influenced by these ideas. But they also had something in the Bible that God talked about, wisdom. And to a point where they personified wisdom, some of the Old Testament Jews who were philosophers slash theologians. And so John, writing at a time, he knows all this. He has all this background information and uh, God inspires him by writing this, in the beginning was the word. So Greeks, contextualizing it, they would have been like, yeah, okay, yes, the word was there in the beginning. You know, to their minds, reason was there in the beginning. Uh, He gives it a name. He was with God in the beginning. Maybe they personified Logos. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But finally, by verse 14, John says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It's like, he takes some of their culture, he takes some of their context, and he brings it and says, Jesus is that word. Jesus is God. And he is with us. He is in the flesh, dwelling among us. Imagine... Oh yeah, let's go on to the, to the rest of the uh, writing from Leslie Newbegin here. Every statement of the gospel is in words. The Bible it is conditioned by the culture of which those words are part. And every style of life that claims to embody the truth of the gospel is a culturally conditioned style of life. There can never be a culture-free gospel. So Leslie Newbegin goes on in this book to argue that this is an essential part of us witnessing and uh, sharing the gospel with any culture. Now imagine for a second you, um, you are in the 1600s. You are sailing over to North America where you know of indigenous people that are there. And let's hypothetically say you know their language. And you want to teach about Jesus being the good shepherd. Well, how do you tell somebody who's never seen a sheep, let alone flocks of sheep and a shepherd, about what, like, that means nothing to them. It means absolutely nothing. And that's why context and culture are important. That's why they can't be, it's essential for sharing the gospel. I mean, look at, any time I interpret scripture, the first things I do is I look at what's the context? What's, the, what's surrounding that passage? What's, where's its place in Scripture in the story that God is telling us? What are the cultural understandings? Again, sheep, shepherd. I've, I mean, I've never raised sheep. I know Libby has, but not many. I don't know what it's like. You know, what's the original meaning of the text? Because we have, it was written in Greek or Hebrew, Then it was translated into English, and we have dozens of translations to try to just craft it the exact way and what it means for us. But we still have to sometimes go back to the original language because translation is tricky. It's hard. Despite the best efforts of all our translators, it's still not perfect ever. And so we come to Where does that leave us with this passage? So we know these Jews brought in different elements, different additions to the gospel. And we do the same things. We do the same things. Um, 
I've seen, I've been a part of, I've felt a gospel of works. You can go to the next slide. And the next slide. What's a gospel of works? Well, let's say you come to church for the first time. You don't know Jesus. And, and you come to know Jesus. You come to know God. And this church celebrates. It's happy. It's delighted. Super excited. Good. And then you've been at the church for a while, and you start to hear certain messages of like, all right, well, every Christian, if you're a good Christian, you've got to pray in the morning every day. If you're a good Christian, you better be reading your Bible every morning. Oh, well, you've got to grow closer to the church. You just can't come on Sunday mornings. You just can't do that. Like, you've got you to gotta be part of a small group. Or the prayer gathering, or this or that. And where you came to Christ freely and the church celebrated that, you've started now over the years to develop a sense of guilt because you just stop feeling like you live up. Because, well, you, you came to Christ freely. Sure, you didn't have any of those practices before. But now, you must, by this point, you, of course you are doing this. If you're not, ugh, ugh. Oh, well, they just come on Sundays, those Christians. They've been, they've been Christians for a long time, but yeah. Or they, you know, they'll never be here. They'll only be here on Christmas and Easter or, you know, the special holidays or what have you. And, I've, and I share this one because I've been a part of a church that has this feeling. That if you aren't doing these extra things, you almost feel like a worse Christian you feel less than what you started with. Now, all of those things are good. It is good to pray. It is good to read your Bible daily. It is good to do all those things. But when it is coupled with guilt, when it is coupled with this, it makes you feel less than. Well, that starts being a gospel of works. As like, well, I only feel good about my faith if I'm doing all these things. No, 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 no. Those things can make you feel good because you are interacting with an internal God who loves you. Not because those things make God love you more. Second gospel I've seen in our culture is, is the affirming, the universalist gospel. And we all, I've, I've seen this in different things, but... Here's where it comes from. What are the two commands Jesus gave us? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. To love others. And some people come to a point where they're just like, I need to love everybody. And for me, that means I need to accept everybody fully into the kingdom of God. Their motives are good. And they must love really well. And it isn't a reaction to what? Well, if, if I'm honest with reading how our culture, our church culture has been from time to time, we haven't been very good at the second commandment that Jesus gave us. We've often been hateful to many groups that live a different lifestyle than us. Instead of trying to figure out how we love somebody who is different than us, we, it's just easier to push them away in hate. And so the response of some people is to just, everybody's in all the time. I can't judge anybody. And that's it. We as Christians need to find a different alternative. We're part of a denomination that's not affirming. And I agree with that. But at the same time, I can't just, you can't go to hate. You got to figure out a way to love. That's Jesus' second commandment. He only gave us two. You can't love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength if you're not loving others as well. You got to, everybody's got people in our lives that don't follow God. We got to love them. And if we can't love them well, they're never going to be interested in God. The third gospel that I've, that I've seen, um, I'm, I'm calling it the recommitment gospel. I couldn't, 
I couldn't land on the right word for this one. So, we often in our lives, um, or we've often in the church, we learn to sometimes manage our sins really well, whatever they may be. Greed, um, pride, um, sexual sins, um, addictive sins, numerous things. We, we learn to manage those. We learn to hide those. But we also, as a church, we sometimes change the gospel a little bit. And, you know, I, I remember having this fear early on as a Christian. Um, I would ask Jesus for forgiveness. Some time would pass. Obviously, I sinned. And my fear sometimes would be, what if, what if I die and I haven't asked God for forgiveness? Is that it? Is my relationship broken? Because I need to ask God for forgiveness for those sins. And so I call it the recommitment gospel because one thing I've seen is that sometimes we can feel like we always need to recommit our lives to Christ. Because we've fallen away from him. Well, Christ doesn't fall away from us. When we believe in God, he's there. So Jesus, in the Old Testament, so we sin, what do they do? They would have to have another sacrifice of animals. And we do these sacrifices weekly, daily, uh, yearly specific sacrifices. It's all laid out in the Old Testament. But with sins, like, Jesus died once. His, his forgiveness is eternal. It is effective always moving forward. And so our response doesn't always need to be this. We don't need to have this fear of, if I'm not asking for forgiveness and recommitment to Jesus, Jesus will no longer be with me. Jesus is always with us. Uh, his forgiveness is always effective. That's why we know when we say, God, can you forgive me? It's already happened. We've already had it. He's already given it to us. Jesus wants us to deal with our sins. It's like Romans 6. <laughs> Sometimes speaking off the top of my head, I'm getting the wrong one. But Paul is talking to the Romans and he's saying, you know, it's not a free pass to just keep sinning and going on sinning and never changing. Because we have God's grace within us. God is constantly refining us and changing us. But if we want to move forward, we don't just live in a perpetual state of thinking forgiveness is the goal. Living a forgiven life. It's living a... Um, it's being purified in Christ. Because Christ has already forgiven us for those sins. It's acknowledging them before God. I know I've done these, God. Thank you for, for, your, for your forgiveness. He's given it already. He's done it once. He did it eternally 2,000 years ago. All of our sins are, are forgiven. They already are. And the only way we become out of joint with God is if we deny him. If we don't want him anymore. But if we keep coming to him in prayer we keep coming to him in all these things. God is with us, always. Again, it comes back to the simplicity of the gospel. I turn back to John 1, verse 12 again um, to close out. Because it is very simple. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It's simple. It's very basic. We need to constantly be coming back and checking ourselves and saying, and this is where reading scripture becomes important. This is where prayer becomes important. Asking God, am I, am I making this harder than it needs to be? Am I adding things that you didn't add on to my requirement of following you and being in communion with you? Well, let's pray. Jesus, thanks for today. Thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. 
Thank you that knowing that you are Lord, knowing that you died for our sins and have forgiven us, and that you rose from the dead, showing your power as Lord and God over this creation. Jesus, I pray that you would help us to move forward and that you would help us to know this truth and share this truth with others. Um, As we take communion, God, I just ask that you would remind us, remind us that your body was broken for us to forgive our sins. Remind us that your blood was spilled for a new covenant so that we can be your children.